I'm very uh, happy to to welcome uh, Dr. Giada Sebastiani uh, for her presentation of feelings and after national age gap. What do we know? Combler le manque de connaissances sur la NAF et la NASH, que sait-on? So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Giada Sebastiani uh, because she is uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, in my, we work in the same unit. She is a clinician scientist and hepatologist, investigator at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Canada, and her work focused on chronic liver disease, fatty liver, HIV and comorbidity, and non-invasive assessment of liver fibrosis by uh, FibroScan and biomarkers. She, she is author of a lot of publications, more than 200, uh, and also in several uh, book chapter, conference paper, with a lot of citations shows she is really uh, an excellent clinician scientist, and she is also awarded as a prestigious clinical research salary award from the Fonds de Recherche en Santé du uh, Québec. And she works also with the CIHR, CIHR Canadian HIV Trial Network, the Canadian Society of Transplantation, and also the FRQS Réseau SIDA et Maladies uh, Infectieuses. So, um, Jada. It's your time for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Bertrand. First of all, I would like really to thank you for the kind introduction and especially Mike and the Fatty Liver Alliance for organizing really an amazing program that uh, I am very proud and very honored to be part of. I think as it was said in the previous session, I think it's really important that we center now NAFLD on the role of primary care physicians. So uh, next, please. So these are my disclosures in terms of grant research support and my uh, other relationships. Next. So I really would like uh, to start with what we know, because my lecture is really about uh, what we know and the logic lo and the knowledge gap. Next. So I really would like to to start with the key developments uh, that uh, we know until now in NASH. Uh, we started actually with NASH in 1980 with the definition from Ludwig. So it's really a 42 years story with, uh, with NAFLD and NASH. And then uh, already in 1990 and 2000, there were already important information in the association of this condition with metabolic risk factors, then moving to histologic definition, to the first uh, uh, PIVENS trial of the treatment of the disease with vitamin E and pyoglitazone, and then now moving also to the diagnostic tools that were already mentioned by my esteemed previous colleague. And there are several initiatives really looking at the, at the non-invasive test uh, to uh, diagnose fibrosis and NASH in this population. But I really would like to show you that actually it was quite an early phase of the key development of NASH that the main risk factors for this condition have been identified, which is really related to clinical risk factor, OMA, and uh, insulin resistance and diabetes. Next. And indeed, now, where are we going? Where are we going in terms of key developments? And where are we going in terms of what we know related to the main conditions associated to NASH? Next. And what we know, it's really that diabetes, as it was already mentioned by my esteemed colleague, is probably the main driver of this condition. And diabetes in North America, and you see here on the left, the data on the US population and on the right, the data on Canadians, really, we have 11.3% of the US population has diabetes and 8.8% of the Canadian population has type 2 diabetes. And you can see that there is a trend in the increase in the total di diabetes and the diagnosed diabetes in the United States. Next slide. And uh, also, obesity is a very important comorbidity that also drives the current epidemic of NAFLD. You can see here that the prevalence of diabetes has changed very significantly in the past 30 years in the United States with prevalences that were about 10, 20% in the 1990, but that they moved uh, in a, a very steady and increasing way until the 2020, where we have uh, areas of the uh, United States with 30, 40% of the prevalence of diabetes with projections that are even worse. You can see that the national prevalence will rise to 48.9% by 2030. Next. 
And we have actually similar data uh, in Canada. And in Canada, 26.8% of Canadians lived with obesity in 2018. And with a very uh, difference uh, pre in prevalence in terms of different provinces. So there is actually the geographical variance here. For example, you can see in Quebec, it's lower than the average. But for example, Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island, and other provinces is actually higher than the prevalence. So, so there is a quite in interesting interesting geographic uh, difference in the distribution of obesity. Next. And uh, as Canadian National Network, uh, we have actually modeled the burden on NAFLD using Markov modeling, adopting historical trends for obesity prevalence and see where are we going in terms of the uh, uh, burden of NAFLD NASH in the next 10 years in Canada. And what I think is very worrisome in Canada is that uh, in, by 2030, we will see almost doubling the prevalent compensated cases of liver cirrhosis due to NAFLD in Canada and 100% increase in prevalent decompensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma and liver transplant cases due to NAFLD in our country in Canada. Next. And this is this trend is actually very similar. This is another modeling study published in Journal of Hepatology in 2018, which modeled the, the incidence of the compensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and liver-related death among prevalent NAFLD populations in the next 10 years. And you can see that these trends are consistent in other countries. You can see here, for example, China, France, Germany, Italy, and so on. Next. So I think that from this data, it's quite clear that uh, the main at risk populations for these conditions uh, that are uh, patients with type 2 diabetes and patients with obesity are actually mostly seen by primary care physicians. And this was already mentioned by my previous esteemed colleague. So really, the primary care physician is at the center of many of the of the access many of the tests uh, that uh, will need to be done in this at risk population in order to target the screening strategy that it was already mentioned for example we know that uh, patients uh, they that primary care physicians can do the fibrosis screening they also can can do the early access to uh, to uh, to modification of lifestyle and so on so i think that really it's very important to clarify that the primary care physician has a central role in all this pathway. Next. So because uh, we are asking, we are speaking now with primary care physician about the need to recognize this condition, my question also that I pose to myself, uh, do we have consistent liver guidelines that we can offer to primary care physicians, for example? These are guidelines here summarized from the main, uh, uh, some of the main associations of the liver. And uh, if you do the next, you can see that I really wanted to see if there were differences, the main themes related to NAFLD in terms of screening, for example, you can see that not all the guidelines recommend consistently the screening. For example, there are different strengths in the recommendation of the screening between the American Association, the European Association, the Asian Pacific. Next. Also, in terms of which are the tests next, the, which are the tests that should be that should be used in terms of the fibrosis uh, uh, diagnostic assessment, uh, most of the guidelines indeed recommend the FIB4, for example example, but for example, the Asia Pacific said that there is no recommended or preferred algorithm for now. Next. Uh, on the same line, if we go next to the lifestyle intervention, it is consistently recommended to use uh, and to target weight loss with our patients or so lifestyle modifications, but uh, there are differences in terms of which of the dietary regimen has to be recommended to our patients. Some recommend Mediterranean diet, some do not recommend any specific regimen. Next and next. So here, in terms of the pharmacological treatment, also we can have some differences because both the American and the European Association uh, mentioned vitamin E and pyoglitazone, but for example, the Asian Pacific don't, don't recommend, doesn't recommend vitamin E. So there are some differences even across the liver guidelines. Next. Uh, 
And I was also interested next to see what the endocrinology guidelines, we have also some guidelines that have been produced by our colleagues endocrinologists, the American Diabetes Guideline, the AACE, and also there are also some guidelines recently published, some position statement from the American Heart Association. So other specialties, how they approach specifically the screening of for NASH and liver fibrosis. Well, the ADA and the ASA, they actually recommend screening for NASH and fibrosis, especially in patients at high risk, which are identified obviously with those patients with type 2 diabetes, elevated liver transaminases or fatty liver and the ultrasound. But also the American Heart Association recently has actually uh, recommended to consider the evaluation for hepatic steatosis when multiple risk factors are present, particularly type 2 diabetes. So there is always the insistence on the type 2 diabetes as the main risk factor, probably for this uh, uh, condition and especially for liver fibrosis associated to this condition. Next. And I would like really to see and to show you that actually there are not uh, specific guidelines that have been developed for the primary care physician. And I think this is very important because uh, to have uh, dedicated and adopt developed guidelines for primary care physicians, because this will empower primary care physicians as prevention stakeholders and incentivizing them for their novel know, figuring out with diagnostic tool and the lifestyle changes best work in primary care, specific in the setting of primary care, and how to build the clinical pair pathways, especially for the most severely affected patients, but with the involvement of primary care from the beginning. Next. So now let's move to the knowledge gap. What, how is NASH and NAPLD perceived by providers and also by patients? Next. So in this, uh, in this slide, you see that I really think that the levels of knowledge gap are multiple levels. We have the, no and they are very specific. There is the level of the provider where there are multiple providers actually involved in, in the care of NASH, right? We have uh, hepatologists, primary care, we have endocrinologists, cardiologists, and dietitians. So it's important to add these levels of knowledge gap. Then we have the larger knowledge gap of the patient at the patient level, and then obviously at the policymaker because we wanted to involve also the policymakers. Next. And here you can see a global survey of over 2,200 physicians. And you can see that uh, there were differences in the correct identification of NAFLD and also in cardiovascular disease as the primary driver of the cause of death in these patients, according to the different specialty, pathologists, gastroenterologists, and uh, endocrinologists, and also uh, primary care physicians. Uh, next, I don't see my slides anymore. Sorry, I see some blank creating event magic. I don't see my slides. <laughs> I don't know if this is normal, but I don't see my slides. Yeah, this is the one. So next slide, please. So here as Canadian National Network, we have actually conducted a Canadian survey on the knowledge of NAFLD among the Canadian physicians. And we have found that actually a significant proportion, not only primary care physicians, but also specialists and nurses thought that the prevalence of NAFLD in Canada was much lower than it actually is. Next slide. And uh, also, what was interesting, actually, the recognition of diabetes as the main risk factor for NAFLD associated advanced liver fibrosis was not consistently recognized by all the providers and actually only by a, a sub, sub portion of the providers. Next. And uh, again, uh, we actually show that uh, uh, most of the providers still use the liver biopsy in 2014. But if we move to afterwards next, we see that liver biopsies, again, next slide, next uh, click, you can see that uh, actually liver biopsy is still used next by most of the of the providers, but also there is a significant increase between 2014, the first survey that we did in 2021, there was a significant increase in the use of non-invasive tests compared to 2014. Next, and next, please. Yes, next, next. <laughs> 
And then uh, also the main concerns of doctors around non-invasive tests, which is very important for the widespread use of this test, was mostly related next to the lack of access of this test, which has been reduced from 2014 to 2021, and also by the lack of updated guidelines, which I think is very symptomatic of the fact that we need updated guidelines, especially for primary care physicians. Next and next. And finally, you see here that primary care providers here in this survey, they really looked at the specific needs of primary care providers. And I think what was very interesting is that they perceive, for example, lack of time for this condition or unsure of how to diagnose this condition. Next. And also, you see here that uh, in terms of private practice pra practice patterns, there are many of the non-invasive tests that are indeed used by, by primary care physicians. Next. And here, something that I found very interesting, specifically in this survey, is that 58% of primary care physicians would support an apple disc screening, but only 22% used biomarkers and 23% used fiber scan for risk stratification. And 80% of primary care physicians reported barriers to treating apple D, and also they complained on no consistent diet that was recommended uh, for these patients. Next. And finally, I think it's very important to report the experience of patients. Patients in this survey, they reported ambiguity about the diagnosis. Majority of patients are aware that weight loss via nutrition and exercise were the primary therapy, but most patients were asymptomatic and diagnosed incidentally. Next. And you can see here several of the sentences, the quotes from the patients themselves, that really they feel that you, it's like an exclusion, there is a lot of ambiguity. I find this very interesting for the patients. Next. So I think that overall, the primary care physician role is essential, but we have also to tailor treatment recommendations to provide education to always involve all, all, always patients also in our, in our uh, guidelines and uh, in the recommendations, because they are the ones that have to absorb these recommendations. Next. So uh, in summary, next. Um, the prevalence of NAFLD and associating complications is obviously that will continue to rise, and especially of the main risk conditions. Liver guidelines present some differences in screening and management. Next. And also providers, I think that we see that there is significant knowledge gap on frequency of the disease, at risk populations that need screening, and also diagnostic methods, and also at the specialist level, not just at the primary care physician level. Next. For patients, I think that they are really eager to have more information on the disease and especially on the clinical presentation and on the definition of this disease. Next. And essential to tackle knowledge gaps at multiple levels, in, instead, not only one direction, but affected people, providers, and policymakers. Next. And need for empowerment, absolutely, of primary care physicians with primary care physician center guidelines and care. Next, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sebastiani. Uh, for, it was very clear, and uh, you show very well the, the, the challenge and the knowledge gap. Uh, we, you face and we faced actually. Uh, there is a, a question for you uh, about um, the the really the impact of NASH and diabetes. So uh, you, you explained very well that diabetes seems one of the main driver, but do you think there is like a bidirectional relationship, you know, impact on diabetes and NASH in, or NAFL, impact on NAFL on diabetes? And do you think we need to, to, to think and to, 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 to take in charge this, uh, these two diseases in, in, in the same paradigm? That's that's an excellent question. Actually, I, I totally agree that uh, this is uh, it, ha it has to diabetes and NAFLD have to be seen as in a holistic way. There is a clear bidirectional association between the two conditions because patients who have NAFLD and who don't have diabetes, for example, at the diagnosis, they have a higher incidence of developing uh, type two diabetes in the future. And on the other side, I call it the perfect storm. Actually, this association, la tempête parfaite. Uh, on the other side. 
like patients who have diabetes and actually who have NAPLD, they have more difficulties in controlling the diabetes in uh, uh, also with the, with the anti-diabetic medications. So there is absolutely a bidirectional association. So I totally agree. I think the two conditions should be seen and treated together in a holistic and multidisciplinary fashion. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Sebastiani, for your excellent presentation.